Dan Proft here from the Skyline Club atop the Old Republic building in downtown Chicago for another installment of Against the Current. Very fortunate on this edition to have our friend Steve Moore from the Heritage Foundation, distinguished fellow from the Heritage Foundation, uh, a card-carrying member of the punditocracy in DC, but uh, somebody that is not afraid to operate on the basis of principle rooted in foundational economic thought which makes him different than most of the pundits. And Maybe the it, chief economist for WIND and, Radio. And the chief, well, right, exactly. You can check out Steve every Wednesday morning on my little show with Amy Jacobson, Chicago's Morning Answer on AM Unless they get bumped by somebody more important. Well, that's, no, well, sure. That's the business. Sure. If Rom ever comes on the show, then we may bump you for Rom, but that's unlikely to happen. So uh, speaking of star stage and screen, you have, even though you're a big DC, you know, Eastern establishment, elitist, big player. Uh, you've, <laughs> got, you've, got, you've got Illinois roots. I do. I grew up in the Chicago area. I went to New Trier High School. I went to University of Illinois. I'm a it, longtime Cubs fan. Go Northwestern. At you New went to Northwestern, right? I, I, I did. Go Cats. I'm not proud of it. I wish you wouldn't have brought that up. <laughs> well, the uh, football team, at least. Every time Northwestern is brought up, the value of my degree declines. <laughs> every time they're in the news. But, uh, yeah, right. At New Trier, it was uh, the pantheon of great, illustrious New Trier alum. It's Charlton Heston, Ann Margaret, Rock Hudson, Steve Moore. And Rahm Emanuel. And Rahm Emanuel, who, who <laughs> he was, went to west. I went to east. But but he's was he in your class because he's your age. He, I believe he's a year older than me. Did, did you bully him or something? Is that why yeah, he's so irascible? <laughs> I think it must or, be. I think that. So, made so him you didn't know him in high school. I did not. But yeah. he, I don't. Where did he go to college? I don't know. I went to U of I. Yeah, he went to Sarah Lawrence, which uh, not a lot of uh, men go to. He did not. He went to Sarah Lawrence. <laughs> Yeah, he couldn't get into Vassar, apparently, so he went to Sarah Lawrence. I mean, it is bizarre, I agree. But we'll, we'll talk about Rom okay. and the city. Um, but I want to start with a, a piece that you wrote recently, It'd probably be a topic for uh, at least the near term in the mm -hmm. presidential campaign, which is that this budget deal, <laughs> this outgoing budget deal that John Boehner agreed to with the President of the United States, you termed it the worst budget deal since George Herbert Walker Bush's budget deal where he went back on his no lips. new taxes pledge. Yeah, yep. Why? Uh, because the one thing that um, that Republicans have done that's been a big victory, and you can't uh, you can't really point to a lot of victories the Republicans have had because you had a very liberal president. Uh, the big victory they had was remember after those fiscal cliff negotiations mm -hmm. they had uh, about four or five I think it was 2011. Uh, we finally kind of cornered Obama and we got him to agree to budget caps and a sequester process so that if the spending was over the caps. The guillotine comes out and it trims all the programs. And remember, do you remember? In, I think it was 2012 when Obama closed the air traffic control towers and so on sure. because we had a four percent cut in spending and and it all backfired. The on vets them. couldn't see, we'll visit the World War <laughs> yeah. II memorial. But exactly all that yeah, stuff. Right. And it totally backfired because people said, "Wait a minute, you know, you're cutting the uh, air traffic control system, but not, you know, the bridge to nowhere and all these other programs." Um, that was a big success. And for the first four years, Dan, um, of that, the spending actually came down. It was, a, you know, that, uh, given that you had the most liberal president since uh, Woodrow Wilson, that was a big victory. Uh, and we used the sequester to bring the spending down. But you know what? And, and by the way, just on that, that in terms of that accomplishment, I interestingly, a couple of weeks before you penned the piece I just referred to, you uh, penned a piece talking about the Tea Party uh, yeah. deserving a lot of responsibility for the success, the one of the few successes. Was these cuts? Yeah. You know, the fact was that the, we had three years in a row where government spending fell under the most liberal president we've had in a hundred years. So that was a big thing. And John Boehner, I had many conversations with him. I interviewed him when I was at the Wall Street Journal. Did a famous interview with him that was uh, in the journal where he said that Barack Obama doesn't think that the spending is the problem. And. Um, I'm shocked, actually, that John Boehner, that is his legacy. And so he's just, he's thrown out that legacy with this budget deal, because what it does is it essentially eliminates the budget caps, it eliminates the sequester, and it provides, uh, it, 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 similar, it raises the debt ceiling by a trillion dollars with no conditions attached, no so, conditions. So, I mean, knowing Boehner as you do, um, it, before you were at Heritage, you were yeah. an editorial board member yeah. of the Wall Street Journal, as you just kind of referenced. Why? Well, why, why do <laughs> why? they do it? Why do they do it? Because they feel that uh, they they lost the last round. That when the when the um, remember when we had the um, the shutdown and so on, they think they lost that. And I said, well, wait a minute. Wait, wasn't you... wasn't that an advance of taking back the Senate? Exactly. You know, how, how did you lose that? And by the way, you know that that actually got people focused on this fiscal crisis. But they're in the fetal position. And this is the thing about Republicans. They don't. Here's my feeling about it. I don't think I don't care if Republicans fight and lose, but at least fight. Yeah, at least fight. Don't. Don't you know capitulate and surrender before you even fought. That's the 
policy end of this. I'm going to make a political argument, and this runs against what my friends at some of the Wall Street Journal say and so on. Oh, he had to do this to set right. us up for 2016. No. Are they not paying attention to Trumpism, mm -hmm. to the anger out there? Uh, you know, you see this and hear about this every day when you're on the radio. Let's talk to folks. People are cranky. They're angry. They think Washington is out of control, incompetent. You've got a, a Congress that has an 8% approval rating. I wrote a piece today saying, believe it or not, they found a way to, to bring that approval rating down. Right. Because, Just when you think they hit bottom, they dig. Exactly. Yeah. Now they're going to get to 5%. And that's an astonishing thing. I, I think that, that you're going to see, this actually, I think, jeopardized Republican chances of winning the White House, which is the most important thing. We must beat Hillary if we're going to advance any kind of pro-growth economic agenda. Yeah, but OK, so, so here, here's the thing that always baffles me. You go to any Lincoln Day or Reagan Day dinner anywhere in the country, yeah. and everybody offers We're their, conservatives their and, off, and they offer their payons to Lincoln yeah. and right. Reagan. Yeah, sure. We have to get back to Reagan principles, yeah. and they they laud Reagan, but they don't emulate him, right? In, in a 21st century context, why don't you learn the lessons of Reagan or governors that we put up on pedestals like Mitch Daniels or Scott Walker who transformed their states? Why don't you look at the model? and then replicate it. So you give them credit and you hold them up for plaudits, but then you go to Washington, D.C., or you go to your state legislature, or you go to your gubernatorial mansion, and you walk away from all the things you're celebrating. Dan, it's, it's, curious. Worse, it's worse than that. I agree with what you said, but it's worse than that. These candidates, when they ran for the House in 2010 and 14, and when they ran in the Senate in 2014, they ran as fiscal conservatives. They said, we're going to balance the budget. We're going to get a spending under control. We're going to get Washington under control. So, OK, so we as voters said, OK, we'll give you one last chance, because right. Republicans have let us down a lot. So we elected a Republican House and a Republican Senate in 2014. It won, what, seven or eight Senate seats or something like, maybe more, uh, maybe nine. That was a big victory. So the first year these guys are in power, they increased the budget by $300 billion, almost 8%. That's worse than the Democrats. And so what does uh, Paul Ryan ascending to the speakership mean? Is Are we going to see a sea change? Or are we going to see kind of incrementalism that's triumphed as a sea change? I think Paul, I'm very much uh, Assum Paul Ryan and, and, and assuming, let's assume just for the sake of argument, a Republican president. So there's no more, oh, well, we've got President Obama or we've got Hillary Clinton in the White House. Yes. It, because that's really when the rubber's going to meet the road for Republicans. Because then you get nobody to blame. you got no boogeyman. <laughs> They're so hate now, that. what are you going to do with both the, the executive and the legislative branches? You've got to move a policy agenda. What are they going to do? So, oh, look, I, you're not going to get me do? to say uh, a bad word about Paul Ryan. He's a longtime friend. And I think he's actually going to be a great speaker. Mm -hmm. He's smart. He's likable. He's strategic. He's got a he, low bar to he, clear. He's got a low bar to clear. He wants to do tax reform, entitlement reform, all the things that uh, that you know make me tick. Um, but I'll, I, I am going to say one thing, bad thing about him. I thought that his reaction to this budget deal was a little wishy-washy. The first day he said, "This is a what was the term he used." Um, about the process, it was something like stupid process, or yes, you know, right. something like that. Yes. The, the process, process is, is the problem. Yeah, and and, and I the I process thinking, leads to bad results. Yeah. and the like. And yeah. I'm thinking, yes, Paul, this was a terrible process to have four guys in a room, you know, make up the four trillion dollar budget. That's not the way our government's supposed to work. But it's, this isn't a this isn't the it's not the process. It's the product they came out with. I mean, the product is completely corruptive. It's against everything you stand for. It's increased the budget deficit, increased spending, increased government involvement yeah. in our lives. Yeah, but the problem is he can't throw yeah. Boehner under the bus because well, he knew what they were going to do. Then just keep then just just be quiet. Well. But he's supporting the budget deal, and I I think by the way. I think that this budget deal may go down. I don't think it's likely, but I think there's going to be these guys in Congress are living in a bubble. They really are. They have no idea what's going out on out here in real America. They're not. It's like their antenna isn't picking it up. Republicans who vote for this, they're going to get primaried. A lot of them are going to lose, and they should. Well, what about uh, the Chamber of Commerce, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and big well, corporate interests that look as the look at all this that we're talking about and say, yes, the problem in the House is not Boehner, and it's not it's Paul Ryan leadership, it's the Freedom, Freedom Caucus. Caucus yeah. uh, I don't always agree with Freedom Caucus. You know, um, I think, that I love these guys, I love Jim Jordan, I think he's a superstar in the making. Uh, sometimes I think that they, look, you have to govern, and it is hard if you're John Boehner or Paul Ryan to get the cobble together the 218 votes, and that's what you have to do to move things along, to get a budget and so on. But um, these guys are heroes in most cases, and, and they're not the problem, we just need more of them. We need more of them. And so uh, with respect to the presidential race, 
uh, you and some other leading lights of free market supply side mm -hmm. economic thought, including Larry Kudlow. Right. Of course, we remember from CNBC, and he's still going to run for the Senate in uh, Connecticut. Is he going to do it? I think he is. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Wouldn't that be fun? It would be so much fun. Uh, that, would gonna, be, that, that would be fun speechifying <laughs> on the Senate floor. That'd and he's going to take out Dick Blumenthal, who's a big liberal, and then we're going to nationalize this race. We've got to get him on your radio show soon. I love that. And, uh, and we'll, uh, we will... Um, we're going to win it because it's going to be about uh, it's going to be about growth economics. Uh, Connecticut is a state very much like Illinois. What do you think the number one issue there is? Taxes. People have been taxed to death, just like in Illinois. Well, they have huge unfunded pension liabilities about, like yeah. Illinois and all yeah. the other attractive problems. And people problems. are all leaving, just like in Illinois. They're going to Florida, Arizona. Uh, so uh, that's going to be great. We're but in have... addition to that, you and Kudlow and some others yeah. uh, that are like mine have been kind of... Committee to unleash prosperity. Correct. Yeah. And you have been walking through interviews with all with of the, the leading presidential yeah. candidates. The only one we haven't gotten to yet is Trump. We're still waiting. Although Arthur met with him, Arthur Laffer met with him for about two hours before he came up with his tax plan. He's got a pretty good tax plan. I don't agree with a lot of what Trump says. Yeah. I don't agree with him on immigration and trade because I'm pro-immigration and pro-trade. But uh, he is, uh, you know, he's an interesting character and he's certainly a whole hell of a lot better than Hillary. Look, Hillary is talking, Dan, about a 45% capital gains rate, about freebies, about free medical care, free, you know, parental leave, free kindergarten, free doggy care, <laughs> free, you know, everything is going to be free, higher medic, social security benefits. And the question is, how is this going to be paid for? And she said, oh, we're just going to tax the top 1%. Well, even if you could, you know, that's not going to get you there. The, it's, it's, well, yeah, it's not but, math. But, 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 but she's running against a guy who thinks you can run the U.S. economy on Vermont maple syrup. So, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> that's it's, true. she doesn't have, you know, but at least, she just has to marginalize Bernie Sanders and then she can get back to where you know, uh, sane people. But I'll that. give Bernie Sanders some credit. I mean, uh, first of all, uh, I think Bernie Sanders is at least as honest. Yeah. He said he was asked how we're going to pay for this. They're going to raise the payroll tax on everybody. He was going to pay more taxes to get all these things. At least he's honest, folks. If you want to pay, pay more taxes, vote for Bernie Sanders. If you think that's the way, if you think socialism is really the way to go, uh, I really think the difference between Bernie Sanders and and uh, Hillary is just. Very, just very slight degrees. Difference. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's right. You, you can t take the girl out of Wellesley, but you can't take the Wellesley out of the girl. <laughs> well put. Let's not, let's not well forget put. about that. Uh, she came from uh, Park uh, Bridge, Illinois, too. Yeah, so yeah. yeah so didn't go the, so well there. We're the repository of a lot of bad actors. Um, <laughs> But but just in terms of your experience, having that up close and personal conversation on substantive policy, uh, we don't get a lot of substantive policy in the context of a, a presidential campaign, mm -hmm. and people don't get the kind of access that you've had to the presidential candidates. I wonder if you could give a little bit of a thumbnail sketch on some of the leading candidates in terms of who do you think is not just uh, doing the color by numbers, I'm a free yeah. market guy because but I'm running for president, understand but, but understand it and are, are not going to cave if they were elected. Uh, well, the two guys who really get this are Scott Walker and Rick Perry. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. So, 2020. Yeah, we look forward to 2020. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but I like. Uh, by the way, I do love those two, and I think they were. Uh, you know, they've been fantastic governors. Um, look, I think Jeb Bush gets it. He was a great governor of, of uh, Florida. I actually think if he could become president, I think he would be a real reformer. I think he would reform the tax system. I think he would reform mm. health care. I think he would inform, reform entitlements uh, and education. Um, he did that all in Florida. His problem is he's a Bush, and people don't want him, uh, another Bush, period, end of story. Although I think he's got a slight chance of coming back. Uh, then you've got, uh, you know, I think um, a guy who is likely to win right now, I think, is probably Rubio. And Rubio is... Uh, you know, he's a strong candidate. I mean, he's got a great story. He's Hispanic. He does well with women and, and uh, minority voters. Uh, he's a big tent guy. I think he does get the growth thing. I don't, I don't agree with everything on Rubio, but I think he's pretty smart, and I think he would cut tax rates and be a free trader. So you think when the New Republic uh, referred to him as the John Edwards of the Republican Party, you think that's well, unfair? That's, uh, I hope not. Boy, that would be, that's that's a low blow. <laughs> yeah, well, it really is. <laughs> that is a low blow. But you know what it's saying. It's the yeah. personal story, the, you know, the mom <laughs> and the dad uh, yeah. work doing menial tasks and now look at me, and that's kind of the focus and the general appeals to the new generation of leadership. But it just, it, for There's me... There's a little bit of that with him. He's yeah, a little Teflon. Yeah, vis viscerally, it just feels like he's a bit of a surface skin. He's young. And I, you know, I'm, I'm not convinced he's, he's seasoned enough to be president. But, um, and then you've got, you know, look, I think it's Ted Cruz is in the race. And Ted is the bomb thrower. But, boy, that guy is smart. And I yeah. think he's the true conservative. <clears throat> and I think maybe uh, Carly. I've done a lot of work with Carly. I think she's the real deal. I think she's someone who gets um, growth and gets government. What, what about uh, the two current front runners as we sit here today, uh, Trump and Carson. I mean, it's, it's <coughs> interesting, isn't it? The, the two people who you think 
are the least scripted turn out to be uh, the front runners at yeah. this point. The two people who <coughs> maybe a lesson for the other kind of more establishment, more seasoned candidates. Uh, boy, it turns out that uh, getting hated on by the Washington press corps is really good for you if you're a Washington, if, if you're a Republican presidential <laughs> candidate. So maybe spend a little bit less time sidling up to a press corps that's going to be antagonistic if you're the nominee. Uh, Donald Trump is not going away. I think he is. He is a phenomenal politician, and I say that with all due respect. I mean, this guy has a way of kind of communicating to middle class fears and anxieties, and uh, he's a demagogue. You know, he, he's been able to tap into these anxieties that people have. Uh, people love the way he deals with the media. Most Republicans go into the fetal position with the media. He sticks it to Always them. on offense. Yeah, a great way to put it. Um, and he is anti-political correctness. And Dan, I think there is such a backlash in this country against political correctness that it's the silent majority of Americans who are sick of dealing with the speech police in this country. Since when do we have speech police? You know, I, I confront it all the time when I go on college campuses. In two days, I'll be at DePaul. I don't know if I'll confront it there, but almost everywhere I go. You will. <laughs> it's just amazing. And and by the way, the people who sh tend to shout me down on, uh, on college campuses, I know I'm straying a little bit here, but are not the students. It's the faculty. Right. It's the faculty that don't want to hear these ideas and don't want these kids corrupted with these, you know, subversive ideas. Um, my point is that, well, one little side point about this. The left always talks about tolerance. They love that word, tolerance. They are the least tolerant people I've ever met in my life. They are not, they, they are tolerant except when it comes to anybody's views who disagree with them. Um, I don't even know how I got off that tangent, but... Um, uh, but look, I, oh, because Trump takes on political correctness, right. and people love that about him. Um, ben Carson, um, I, I have to say, I never saw this one coming. And I, I know Ben Carson, I have nothing but admiration for him. I mean, the greatest surgeon in the world, his story is a true Horatio Alger story. I mean, how he was able to come out of the Detroit ghettos without a father and become, you know, what he, what he is today is a spectacular story of achievement. Um, I think... I think that, look, I think conservatives are tired of being called racist. And, you know, the fact that we can vote for an accomplished black conservative who has these strong values is very appealing to people. And it should be, you know? Well, I mean, well, frankly, too, I mean, think about this. From back in 2008, there were some conservatives who got uh, snookered by one Barack Obama, mm -hmm. including the likes of a George Will and a Charles Krauthammer. So, so you know, that the desire to as you say, signal that mm -hmm. the caricature of us isn't true and I'm going to prove it by doing this. Yeah. It, it, it's so strong that Will and Krauthammer were willing to suspend their good right. judgment when well, it came all, to Obama. I mean, look, we all wanted um, a black president. And, you know, I mean, we wanted that day to come. It's, you know, this is the tragedy of Barack Obama is this is a president who really could have done amazing things. Sure. You know, he could have. I mean, he could have fixed the school system. He could have fixed racial relations. He could have done amazing things when it comes to fighting poverty, restoring uh, the black family in America. I mean, his personal story is a great one. I mean, he's got this wonderful family and wonderful wife and two, a good father, two children. And instead, he moved so far to the left. And, and in fact, the tragedy of Barack Obama's president, there's many tragedies. One is race relations, I'd say, are worse today than when he ran out of office. If, if you, know? you but no, no, just doing the, the quick rundown of some of the leading Sorry. candidates for president. <laughs> you don't no. go on these times. No, it's good. Right. It's good. But, <laughs> but so, so the question is, I mean, if, if you could just install one of these candidates as president, forget, uh, as you know, president? Uh, Ted Cruz has some stylistic problems. He kind of comes across as a aluminum siding salesman I think the best and all that. President. Who, who, who would you want? Who would you say, I think besides guy, Steve Moore and Art Laffer as the ticket, who would be your choice? I think the best president, this may surprise you, I think Jeb Bush would be the best president. Really? I think Jeb is a problem solver. I think he's a conservative. I look, there are a lot of there are things I don't like about Jeb and the thing I dislike most about him is the Bush thing. I mean he's put yeah. in, put all the Bush team together and I think that was that's why he's gonna probably lose. People are sick of the Bush team and putting the old band back together. Uh, but you look at his record in Florida it was superb. I mean it really was he was an incredible governor. Um, and I think look after eight years of a president who knew no, nothing about what he was doing, he was he's completely in over his head. To have someone who is in charge and command 
I think makes a difference. Somebody who can sit across the table from Putin and not, you know, roll over or is dead, that's important. So I, I think he could do it. I think that I think Carly could do it. She's run, you know, corporations. She's got a story of, of accomplishment herself. Um, she's tough. She's the Margaret Thatcher of the Republican Party today. She really I, is an iron lady. She's, she's the she, iron lady. She is, you yeah. got it. Yeah, and I've been, I've, I've been working with her, and I just I love that lady. Uh, I think if she's not the presidential candidate, which I doubt she will be, I think she's got a good chance of being the VP. Uh, I think Ted Cruz and, and Marco are a little young still. I think they're both superb talents. How about Ted Cruz in Attorney General and unleash him? No, I love that idea. What a post. great cabinet we're talking about yeah. here, you know. Um, I, I want to go to something else that uh, that you do. Can I do. be the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors? Yeah, I, I would think so. <laughs> I mean, you, I guess we'll put Rand Paul in charge of the Fed. I mean, you do have a, yeah, kind of a I, cabinet in the making I, in this well, field. Well, no, think about it. I mean, you could have Ben Carson as the HHS secretary yeah. and really oh, yeah. reform. I mean, so yeah. if Republicans win, you know, they could put some incredibly impressive people in, you know, and we could make Donald Trump the... I don't know, labor secretary or something? No, you know? no, no. The what? obvious White House press spokesman. <laughs> Punish the He's Washington press that. corps every single day. Uh, uh, one other thing that you do that uh, some people may be familiar with, but uh, more should be, you and Art Laffer do this rich states, yes. poor states analysis of all 50 Illinois states. Illinois has improved, by the way. Uh, we're, you moved from we, like forty shot past uh, West Virginia. <laughs> you moved from like forty-seven to thirty-nine. I mean, Bruce Rauner is doing some. You know, well, that takes into account the fact that you're not going to rate. You know, that those tax increases are going to go away. If he brings those back, because I guess there are negotiations yes, now right. about that, then you're going to slip back into the forties. Well, well, <laughs> right so, now you're thirty-nine. Well, talk okay? about rich states and poor yeah. states. The states that are at, at the top doing well. Uh, creating jobs and opportunity and right. states that are doing poorly, so, yeah, what are, the, what are okay. the indicia? The biggest story in America that nobody's paying attention to is that the red states in America are getting redder and the blue states are getting bluer. And so you're getting a wider divide in terms of the kind of policies between, you know, mostly southern red states like Texas and Tennessee and North Carolina and Arizona versus the, you know, traditional nor liberal northeastern and midwestern states. And so you get, you, you know, what's happening in the midwestern states for the most part uh, is they're raising taxes, they're raising their minimum wages, they're, they're not right to work states, they're, you know, don't allow drilling, they've got all these environmental policies, you know, all the things that, you know, Paul Krugman tells them that they yeah, do. Right. Red states are following the Art Laffer, Larry Kudlow, Steve Moore model. They're cutting taxes, they're right to work, they're low cost states, they, uh, they have educational freedom, all of these things. And what we find is it matters, it matters a lot. So 1,500 people every day on net are leaving states like Illinois, they're leaving states like uh, Minnesota and California and Connecticut and New Jersey and New York and Vermont, and they're going to red states. This is, this is shifting the center of gravity of this country from north to south. Now, you know, put this very simply, this is why the election of Bruce Rauner was so important. Blue states have to change or they die. It's that simple. You change or you die. You get bled to death. Uh, your, your talent leaves, your families leave, your businesses leave, your jobs leave, and then you've got, you know, 20% tax rates, 80% tax rates, and nobody's left to pay them anymore. Um, and it matters a lot. And so you get, you know, my favorite example is you look at the four biggest states in the country. California, New York, Texas, Florida. Two of those are blue states. Two of them are red states, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, California and New York are, you know, 13% tax rates, right? You know, forced union states, no drilling, da da da. Calif you know what the tax rate in Texas and Florida is, right? A zero. Zero. Yeah. Uh, the income tax. No, no income tax in those states. Uh, they are right to work states. Blah 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 blah. Uh, to put it very simply, in the last 15 years, for every job that was created in California and New York three to four jobs have been created in Texas and Florida. Now, Paul Krugman says that's because of the weather, but he's got to explain to me why people are leaving San Diego and you're going to Houston, right? Because nobody goes from <laughs> yes, San Diego to right. Houston for the weather. Right. Uh, so this is a big deal. And a lot of states are learning from this. I mean, we actually, even some of the blue states are saying, well, you know what? We can't do this much longer. <laughs> what happened to Joe? What happened to Bill? Where are they? They moved to Florida. They moved to Tennessee. They moved to Texas. They moved to Phoenix. And so uh, when you think about uh, rich states and poor states, well, this is an issue that has risen in terms of people's interests, particularly on the Republican side of the ledger, immigration, and what to do about things like sanctuary cities, uh, what to do about <coughs> things like, uh, let, forget even a discussion about legal immigration when you have a federal government that refuses to deport convicted felons mm -hmm. that are here illegally. And so how, how does the Republican Party, the conservative movement, address that issue 
whereby we say we're still America is an idea. We're still a nation of immigrants. We want people that want to come here and right. build a better life for themselves. Right. Um, but at the same time, we, we do believe that borders are right. important and they need to be secure yep. and people that are doing harm to other people right. need to be out. Yes. So let me just finish a point on the blue state, red state. Sure. That's important. This is the number one argument every Republican presidential should be making, every, every conservative around the country. If your model works so well, why are California, New York, New Jersey, Illinois, Detroit a mess? You know, they, you're, there it is. It's everything. You know, Detroit's done everything you've told them to do. Illinois's told them. To, New York's done everything you've told them to do. California's a 13. Why are people leaving? Why are they going to the states that are doing just the opposite? Why is it that states that are run by conservatives are doing well, liberals, because the liberals have no response. They have no answer to that whatsoever. And that, our model, so the point is, the goal of America, if we want to make them, I hate to say this, make America strong again or make America great again, whatever Trump says, we got America make look less like Illinois and less like New York and less like California, or more like Texas, or more like Florida, and more like but Tennessee. It, but is that a winning argument? It they, sure is. Well, because it, it, people get it. Well, people the, get the, it. They get it. But but are are we broadening the tent, so to speak, in the conservative movement? Because what you're talking to is people that are kind of economic opportunity focused in almost a policy sense. Yeah, I want I want government that is business friendly. I want government that respects entrepreneurial mm -hmm. capitalism. Well, let me tell you something. There's a lot of people out there that don't want to be entrepreneurs. They want to work a nine to five job and be secure. Yeah, but you don't and, have the nine to five job, Dan, unless well, well, you've got the entrepreneur who creates the well, job. Well, I, I mean, my God, I get so sick well, of Well, no, no, I, I understand I this. I mean, you have to have an but, employer before you have, before you have an employee. But, but this I know is, but this you know, is Hillary a, cannot connect those dots, but it's true. Well, but this is a dot that Republicans don't connect for the public. <laughs> That's true. Well, this is why we lose nine to five right. workers who yep. are in that yep. middle yep. income, yep. those middle income tranches right. that say, oh, the Republican Party is the, the party of big corporate mm -hmm. America and the guy's making six and seven and eight figures, they're not the party of the guy making right. fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year. And so how do we connect those dots so they know we're not just the party of the entrepreneurial capitalists. We we're gonna reduce taxes on everybody so you can go invent the new Facebook and a lot of people don't want to take that risk. So uh, the answer to this is very simple. Um, Barack Obama's been in charge for the last seven years. We've had liberalism run amok. The Democrats in the first two, three years were able to do everything they wanted to. Obamacare, or, you know, the stimulus plan, clash for clunkers, tax increases on the rich, minimum wage increases, all that stuff. And what has happened? The middle class has gotten crushed. Working women have gotten crushed. Blacks have gotten crushed. Minorities have gotten cr crushed. Young people have gotten crushed. Actually, the only people who prosper is the people in the top 5% exactly or so. Right. That is the point that Republicans have to make is actually, you know what? We do care about working class people. Every, you know, I love this. Uh, Hillary, I think, has invented this, this, uh, this phrase, working class folks. Okay, what is what's happening to working class folks? Everyday they, people. She's <laughs> the champion for everyday people. Sly and the Family Stones, right? Yeah, that's right. She is everyday so, people. She everyday people. So Who have every, their own foundation. She yeah. knows a lot of those people, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> she flies over them. Yes. Uh, they have gotten creamed, and that has to be the republic. You know, it's like Bruce Rauner, one of the things he did so well and so valiantly when he ran for, he went to black neighborhoods, and he went to Hispanic areas, and he went to black churches, and he went to these minority areas, that, and he said, what have the Democrats have done for you? Right. What you know, you vote for them over and over again, and what have they done for you? At least give me a try. Let me see if I can do better. Republicans have to have this, say the same thing. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, to me, it's not marginal tax rates. It's not the corporate tax rate. To me, w one opportunity the Republican Party has missed, and to some extent the conservative movement has missed it too, even though we all mm -hmm. talk to one another and say, of course we support this, is making educational opportunity, uh, quality of educational opportunity, school choice, the central organizing principle of the Republican Party because everybody intuitively understands that education is the gateway to opportunity. And they know if you live on the west side or the south side of Chicago, your kids don't get to go to lab schools like Rahm's kids mm -hmm. do uh, or uh, Barack Obama's yeah. kids do or Arne Duncan's kids. And so the Republican Party is the party that's saying your kids get to go to whatever school they can get into. Not only that, we're going to help you finance yeah. it because we're going to open the doors of opportunity that yeah. have been closed. That is why we exist. That's our brand. That is our organizing principle. Why not simplify it down to that? Because everything else flows from education. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, li I love it. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that this is a way of dividing and conquering the left uh, because they are t they don't they look they care about schools, but they care much more about teachers unions than they do about schools because the teachers unions pay a billion dollars of the bills for the Democrats. So they can't cross the teachers unions, and that's why they can't fix the school system. Um, I wrote a story about what happened in D.C. where we have something yeah. like four or five thousand kids who get these these vouchers, and they're all black kids with some Hispanics. And, um, I think there are two whites in the program, and uh, they put it very well. Put these people on the stage with the Republicans and say, and have them tell their story. They, you know what they told me? Barack Obama, why can't I have the same schools for my kids that you have for your daughters? There's no answer to that. I mean, it's simple, yeah, it's, it's linear, simple. it doesn't yeah. take a lot of dot connecting, and, and all the, the way, parents get some it. Some of the kids who sit in a classroom with Barack Obama's kids have these vouchers, and Barack Obama wants to take those away. Right, that's right. And but he so, cares about kids, though. So, so why do we tolerate and why does the business community and the Republican because Party? Because we are the stupid party. Well, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, don't I want a deeper answer. What, what, yeah. I mean, what's the difference when the Republican Party says uh, Republican establishments, uh, establishment Republicans that uh, were behind this discharge petition to reauthorize the ex Export mm -hmm. Import Bank? Um, what's the difference between Republicans saying we should give taxpayer money to CAT? And Democrats saying we should give taxpayer money to Solyndra, other than otherwise, other than CAT being a better investment. What's the difference? There's, There's no difference in principle. There's no difference, and it's it's a, such a problem. I mean, my God, can't the Republicans get get over this XM Bank? I mean, is it really worth it? I mean, look, they say, oh, it's making profits now. Give us some profits. A business bank will go into doing that. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. You know, you you do you do have these major companies like Boeing and Caterpillar that are on the public take. The Chamber of Commerce is spending all its time instead of advocating things like school choice and more pro-free enterprise and lower tax rates. They spend half their time, you know, lobbying for the Export-Import Bank. I mean, it's it's just so absurd. And and you're right, you know, there's $100 billion of corporate welfare. This should be another theme of Republicans. Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama, they're the heads of the Corporate Welfare Coalition. Uh, Republicans should be against, for free enterprise, should be for free enterprise, and free enterprise is, for, is not uh, the same as corporate welfare. It's, it's actually the opposite of that. Last question yeah. before I let you go. You're the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors for the next Republican mm -hmm. president, whoever he or she may be. Uh, so the first thing I'll do for Hillary is. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, 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 so you're going to have to assassinate By Paul the way, Krugman. Hillary is not going to be the next president. No. You heard it first here on the Dan Proft podcast. I, I believe Clinton you. will not be the next president of the United States. I believe you. I believe you. And I'm encouraged to hear you say that. And I hope all those Kankle Caucus members are listening. Uh, so. You're the chairman of the Council of mm -hmm. Economic Advisors. What do we do? For the next Republican president, the with Republican majority. No, no, not, not what's the first thing. It's too easy. Oh, damn. Uh, <laughs> you got Republican majorities uh -huh. in the House yep. and the Senate. What do you lay out in terms of these are realistic things that we can accomplish in our first term to move the needle substantially in the direction of free enterprise? Well, uh, that's pretty easy, actually. And we need uh, the first thing I would do is um, a pro-America energy policy. As you know, I've been on this. I'm writing a book on this called Fueling Freedom. We are the Saudi Arabia of energy in the 21st century. We have more coal. We have more oil. We have more natural gas. It's all American ingenuity, as you know. Julian Simon was my yes, mentor, and right. he told us that American ingenuity is what creates these resources in the first place. And boy, have we done Debunk that! Debunk the population you know, bomb. And we, and we can look. We can not only be energy independent in the next 10 years, we can be the energy dominant country in the world. That's a powerful position in terms of foreign policy and our economy. And I, I believe it'll create millions of jobs and it will. you can do it in a way that's environmentally sensible. It would be great for uh, Illinois, central and particularly yeah, southern have, Illinois, so coal, we don't, they don't have to rely on gas. state jobs. You got it. Yeah. So that's number one. Number okay. two, you do tax reform. And let's just start by, you know, how about this? Rather than having a 40% corporate rate, why don't we have a 15% corporate rate? Why don't we go from being the highest corporate tax rate country in the world, business tax rate, to the to one of the lowest? I guarantee if you do that, companies are going to come back to the United States. They're going to come back in droves. In fact, if you do that, you're going to probably have more uh, jobs than you have workers. Uh, number three, you start rolling back Obamacare, but you do this in a way, Dan, that doesn't repeal Obamacare. It just gives people off ramps, options. In other words, you like can, HSAs? Yeah, HSAs, whatever. Here's what's so crazy about this 
you and I, you know, have totally different values about what you value in terms of health care and what you want a coverage for and what, you, what I want. You may be very risk averse, so you want a low deductible. I may be wanting high. Why not let every American choose the health insurance they want? Obamacare is one size fits all. It doesn't work. Um, you can do this. If you do this, you can cover everybody at lower cost and give people the, the care that they want. And you can do it in a way that doesn't destroy millions of jobs because of Obamacare does do that. So those are three things I'd do right. And by the way, if you could do those three things, it's rocket fuel for the yeah. economy. And uh, one thing that you got to cover that you didn't cover in your three things, but you got to make, make it a fourth. What do you do on the nation's immigration system? Uh, you know, I, I think you do two things. You do what it takes to secure the border. Uh, you know, if, if that means building a wall, do it. I mean, I, and the, but the most important thing is we get selective about who, who we want. And we want people who want to be hard workers, who want to share in our freedoms, who will assimilate into our economy and our culture. Uh, and, and, you know, that might be a, a farm worker for goodness sakes. I mean, that's, sure. and, and you get rid of welfare for immigrants. I don't think any, anybody, who, that used to be, if you came into this country with just the shirt on your back, you made your own way, or you had some, a family sponsor you. We, should, we shouldn't allow government to provide welfare benefits and food stamps for immigrants. I mean, that's, they should, be, and by the way, you look at so many examples, like uh, I just met Andrew Grove not long ago. I mean, he came, he was a, you know, the f founder of Intel. Intel, yeah. He came into this country from Hungary literally with only the shirt on his back. You can do this. We don't, they, people don't need government assistance. All right, All he right. is Steve Moore. Immigration, yes, welfare, no. Distinguished fellow at the Heritage Foundation, supply side economist, uh, economist, excuse me, economist. Are you going to play my theme music that you play for me? On yeah, the radio? I, I'll have to, I'll have to hum mix it. that in. Yeah, I'll have, uh, we'll we'll, <laughs> mi we'll mix it in in uh, post production. And every Wednesday, seven thirty-five a.m. Right? on AM five sixty Chicago. Unless I'm bumped by somebody Amy. really important like Rahm Emanuel. Well, that's correct. <laughs> and uh, certainly, we're not getting supply side economics if we have Rahm Emanuel on the show. <laughs> Next time we talk, we're going to have to talk about the city of Chicago and the, the nutcase. Uh, that uh, the city of Chicago is financially as well. But uh, we'll leave it there for now. Steve Moore, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. Yep.